Hello, this is Chetzar here. Uh, that was that was a dog barking in the background. Welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society podcast. Today is episode number one forty-eight. I interview Mia Arajo, who's an excellent artist, highly underrated, I believe. She's really, really talented. Love her work, love her Patreon, but we'll get into that. Um, yeah, so here we are. I'm recording the intro to this podcast because I need to upload it today for the early edition and get ready for my sale of the tool posters tomorrow. Woohoo. Um, it's been a busy week or so i had uh nico hurtado and carlos torres's convention the golden state tattoo expo this weekend so i might sound a little bit tired it's because i am i uh had a great time there my 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 friend lee shamel the amazing lee shamel he helped me run the booth and uh yeah had a great time really cool convention Nico's amazing. Carlos is amazing. I, it's a, it's kind of, you know, uh, Nico surrounds himself with such great people. It's, it's cool to see because he's such a positive person. F- if you've never met him, he's just got, he just puts out this great energy and the people that work for him put out this great energy. So, um, it's great. It's great to be in that environment around so much positivity. So my hat's off to Nico. And Carlos is the same way. Another dude who's just putting out this amazing energy. Love those guys. So thank you uh, to them for having me. So, yeah, I'm just kind of getting back in the swing of things this week. I've got to, like I said, I've got to release these tool posters tomorrow, which I'm going to put on my patreon and um release to the public uh by friday let's see wednesday they go to patreon 50 dollars and above people then thursday they go to the lower tiers then friday they will go to the general public so that's how i've decided to release them um gotten a little bit of shit from a few people who are thinking that i'm trying to get people to join my patreon just to or like I'm dangling the tool posters over their heads to get them to join the Patreon. Uh, but that's not the case. It's actually a matter of honoring the people who have been on the Patreon since the beginning. The deal I have is $50 and above. You get first choice at any new newly released items. So, you know, the easy thing would be to release them all to the public. That would be way easier for me instead of having to kind of do it in this, uh, in this, uh, you know, roll out over a few days and and stuff, but I'm doing it because I'm honoring, you know, the people that have been supporting me on the Patreon. So it's got nothing to do with trying to get people over to the Patreon. It just so happened to work out that way. So, um, you know, if if people don't want to want to join my Patreon to get a poster, then don't fucking join the Patreon and don't get a poster. I don't care. You know, like I said, this is, this is about me honoring my people that are, supporting me and everybody else can fuck off you know it's like i don't know you anything anyway um it, it, you know it's uh, it's not that big of a deal really but you know it's actually only a couple people that commented about it. everyone else seems pretty cool about it anyway so uh, i'm dealing with that i'm just getting back on my feet again those conventions man they really wear you out Especially the older I get every year, it gets harder to do a convention. Um, it's just a lot of work, a lot of hauling shit around and setting up and then being on for three days in a row and talking. And, you know, I appreciate well, I appreciate the fans coming and being able to talk and interact with them. But still, it's it's exhausting to 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 be on like that, especially for introverts. And we, we talk about this in the interview as well, because me has done some a lot of a lot of conventions and. Um, so she understands. So we, we talked a bit about that. So anyway, that's about it. Um, that's going on in my life. Let's get on with 
let's get on with the um, let's get on with the new subscribers because I forgot to to mention them last week. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure where I left off. Hmm. I guess I'll back it way up. Um, let's start with new subscribers. Okay, we'll start with Brian Sheehan. That's that's Sydney. Sydney's not my dog, but it's someone who helps helps out here with the business. She brings her dog. I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, new subscribers: Brian Sheehan, Jeremy Cross, Anna, Liz, Dimmer. D E M E R, Nathan Wright, who was just a guest on the show. Ron Ransom, uh, Max Edwards, Rob Freitas, Rob Freitas, the mold maker god from Rick Baker's. He's my old buddy from Rick's, who uh, is uh, like the, probably one of the top mold makers in the world, if not the top. I want to have him on the, the show just because he's got so much uh, amazing film history and his background and he, and he really his his molds are so good they're like art pieces in themselves it's kind of inspiring um let's see Brandon neal and eric thompson thank you all for supporting dark art and supporting this podcast and keeping it free for everybody because i couldn't do it without your support okay so we've got that out of the way now let's find the five questions i ran out of five questions so i had to go into the dark art society cooperative and ask for some more questions you can get in the dark art society cooperative secret facebook group by joining our patreon which is patreon.com slash dark art society for as little as a dollar a month twelve dollars a year twenty four dollars for every two years uh thirty six dollars for three years I mean, you pay it monthly, but you get my point. It's pretty cheap. And you get when you do that, you get to um, hear the podcast a day early, sometimes two days early occasionally. And um, there's going to be more bonuses coming as soon as I, you know, kind of get that together. But uh, you also get in the secret Facebook group and you get in, you get membership on the new website we have, which is really amazing. So uh, that's that. Uh, if you want to join my my Patreon as well, it's uh, patreon.com slash chetzar, and I post progress, daily progress, tutorials, time lapses, blah, blah, blah. And you get first opportunities to buy new items, as, as I mentioned with the, the tool gig posters. Okay. All right. Let's get on with five questions and then get on with this interview. Uh, okay. Kenny Rains, who are some of your favorite non-dark artists? That's a very good question. I would say Norman Rockwell, for sure. Amazing. Um, James Bama is another kind of... He, although he's done some kind of genre-related book covers, but uh, a huge James Bama fan. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, uh... Uh, N.C. Wyeth is a good one. I mean, there's so many. There's so many. And there's so many that I don't even really know that are amazing. But those come to mind, so I'll just go with those for now. Um, uh, uh, Michael R. Miller, have you ever tried to do a really in-depth, pure graphite piece of a dystopian creation? Would you ever consider it in the future? Yeah. You know, that's a good question and, and a good point because I am pretty good at, at drawing. I mean, that's the one that's the one thing I've done my entire life throughout all the different twists and turns my artistic life has taken, you know, into makeup effects and oil painting, computer animation, digital music, all these creative, um, you know, explorations drawing was always there in the background so you know i probably have never really drawn a graphite piece as well as i could 
Um, so that's a that's a good good idea. Thank you, Michael. I'm gonna I'm probably I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. You know, I've done plenty of sketches, but the but I you know I never take them pat I never take them as far as I could, just because I'm always thinking about doing things in paint. So interesting, good idea. I'll I'll try and fit that in. Um, Christopher Lee Duncan, do you think you will ever hit some East Coast cons or shows? I don't have anything lined up. But I feel like some pressure to do that because I, you know, when I was doing all the tattoo shows a few years back, I was doing stuff on the East Coast and I was showing it last rights. And I would like to because I get people asking me to come out there a lot. Uh, I just got burned out on all the traveling and I sort of haven't gotten gotten rested up enough yet to think about doing that. So I don't have anything lined up. At this point, I have an open offer to to, to do a um, uh, like a uh, like a talk or a class at 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 Alex Gray's place at, at Cosm. So that would be a great opportunity. Maybe you know do something around that. Um, do a few things. I don't know, but it's something that I'm definitely would like to do. Uh, okay, so that was how many? That was one, two. Three, uh, okay. Sorry, I I haven't prepped at all here. Um, sorry. Uh, okay. Here's a good one because we talked about this, or I talked about this last night with with uh, Steve Clef. We're doing the Skype my Patreon Skype. Uh, We talked about something like this. Okay, Brad Gray. As we have come to expect a certain look that represents and encompasses dark art, do you think as a movement it has a limited longevity? Will it evolve beyond the cliches that fill the genre, skulls, sexy witches, killer clowns, etc.? Yeah, if we don't, um, I will say this, if we don't, broaden what dark art is then i think it will not have the longevity that it should and um you know that's why uh, jeremy cross for example we were, i was talking to steve clef about this one of my students last night how he's his he is has his own niche in the scene it's dark art but it's different you know it's not like everything you would think of dark art and um it's important that if we are if we are serious about this scene and this movement that we um push the envelope and and broaden what dark art means because you know This is what happens in a sense, you know, maybe it happens. Maybe it's what happens in all movements. You know, a movement is born and then it flourishes and then it becomes stale and then it dies. Maybe that's the natural way of things. But, you know, I look at um, the punk music scene and I look at bands, early punk bands uh, like the Minutemen are, are a great example. You know, they came out up out of, out of the punk scene. They were influenced by all these bands like the Germs and the Weirdos and Wire and all these weird, unique, quote unquote, punk bands. And they had a Minutemen had this totally unique sound, as did all the punk bands back then. Black Flag, um, Dead Kennedys. You know, these bands all had their own sound. And then as time went on. You know, punk became about sounding a certain way. Whereas, you know, Mike Watt from the Minutemen always says, punk to us was doing whatever you wanted to do. You know, it was ever whatever we made it. That was punk. So punk wasn't about having a, a sounding like everybody else or looking like everybody else. It was about sounding like yourself and looking like yourself and doing what you wanted to do. So there's always that risk when you get um, 
any kind of organization or a group, there's always that risk that it be, it's going to become homogenized. And I see, you know, I see that as kind of a danger in the dark art scene, especially because, you know, people that aren't really putting a lot of thought into it, you know, they are, they have an idea of what dark art is and, and it's, and it's a narrow definition. And I think we need to push that and find our own place within that. If we are artists, find our own place and not try and, you know, copy people or be too influenced by people, but stake our claim, be unique. And, you know, if you want to do something good for the movement, that's, that's what you should do as an artist. You should contribute to it instead of jumping on the bandwagon, you know, contribute to it, make it a, make it better, make it a, make the scene better because you're in it and you're, you're expanding it and broadening it. So, so I think it's, uh, we all have that duty if we, if we, if dark art means, uh, is important to us, we have that duty to, to, uh, keep it good and not let it get overrun by monsters, snarling, angry browed monsters, you know, it's so much more than that. Okay. Let's see. So was that five? One, sorry. Um, one, two, three, four. I think that was only four, right? Mm hmm. Yeah. Shit. Sorry. Uh, okay. I guess there's one more. Let me give me one sec. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. I'm, I got so much I'm trying to get done today that I didn't really prep for this. Not that I ever do, but, uh, one, Okay, here's this is let me see if I can answer this. Kevin McInnes. What do you do to push into the darkness with your art but keep from being sucked too far into it? Hmm. Hmm. I don't, you know, I've said this before. I don't feel like creating dark art like pulls me in or makes me depressed or sucks me into darkness or anything like that it makes me feel good to do it so i don't i don't i just don't feel like i get that from it like i like i don't feel like i could get uh, maybe that's not what this kevin what you're meaning keep from being sucked too far into it yeah i'm not maybe i shouldn't have answered that one because i'm not sure of the answer. Um, I mean, it's not like I'm, tr it's not like I'm trying to push into darkness either. It's like, it's more like I'm trying to do the most fun thing I can think of. That's what I'm always trying to do with the artwork. What can I do that would be the most fun? And it's always the dark stuff for me. It's fun. I enjoy it. And so, you know, I don't feel like I can go too far with it or I don't feel like I'm worried about getting sucked in because I don't know. I just, it's, it's too fun. It's all about fun for me, really more than anything, anything else that comes from that, you know, helping people with trauma or, uh, things like that are, are really secondary. It's, it's for me, it's just about pure the pure joy of creation and I find that the dark side of things is the most fun and interesting uh, uh, subject to to ex subject matter to explore so okay there's five questions thank you for listening let's get on with the interview it's a great interview with Mia Araujo and uh, thanks again for supporting thanks again for listening if you can do the, the like thing and like like us and rate us and review us that would be great We're trying to spread the word I, I i heard a ton of people come up to me 
at the convention over the weekend and say they love the podcast. So that was pretty cool. So it's it's pretty neat that the that the word is getting around about this podcast. Uh, and then of course there were a bunch of people that you know were fans of mine that had no idea I did a podcast still. So uh, the more you can spread the word, the better it will be for all of us. The the more popular the podcast gets, the you know the the better it will be. The better guests will be able to get and everything else. So. If you, if you can, spread the word, help out. That would be awesome. All right, so here it is. Let's get on with it. The um, Mia Araujo interview. Hello, Mia. Hi, Chet. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Yes. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. I, I I tell you every time I see you, I see you at conventions from time to time and shows, but I'm just I'm a huge fan of your work. I think your your uh your stuff's as as good as it gets as far as I'm Thank concerned. You. Your uh technical ability and, and and your and your style is just like off the charts. Amazing. Amazing. You're very sweet. Thank I lo- you. I love I mean, you know, you know, I'm all about <clears throat> I love portraiture and your portraits are always I love your profile views. I mean, they're just great. It's great. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm blushing, but you can't see it. <laughs> no, I, I can't see it. Blushing inside. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I usually see you at, at Designer Con, right? Or I did that once, yeah, okay, last but... year. And not this this last year, I think it was twenty eighteen. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, but I, I've attended, yeah. I've okay, seen you right, at your right. Booth. Yeah. Because I was telling you you should do you should do conventions. Yeah, I remember yeah, telling yeah. you that because I, you're you stuck. were one of the first to, to tell me that. And I, I held out for a few years, but because uh, I, I guess I just wanted to make sure I had a body of work, at least that was that I was happy with. And, and oh, not really? that I wasn't happy with my past work, but, um, but yeah, I don't know. I guess I just wanted to observe for a while yeah. before jumping in too soon. And... It's kind of scary the first time you do a convention and you, oh, you yeah. know, you know, I mean, especially for people, if you're like me, you're like kind of shy and you know you go to a new place and you don't know anybody and you have to go set this booth up and you've never really done it before it's kind of nerve-wracking it's a big investment too like right just looking at the cost like upfront costs usually when you do gallery work you don't put an upfront cost aside some time right and like maybe framing and stuff but um well and and materials now (laughs) but we (laughs) know yeah yeah yeah, yeah, that's what we that's kind of part of the deal i suppose in the gallery world yeah and we're gonna paint anyway so i guess we do um we do buy supplies and stuff, but with a booth, it's like the table costs and the getting all the stuff in. Like it's it's a lot of money. Right. It's like thousands of dollars. So yeah. it's like I just, to me, I was just like I just want to make sure I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm yeah. going to the right shows. You know, I'm I'm bringing the right stuff. Right, so. right. Do you yeah. have you have you done uh, many shows or just designer con at this point or or? I've done ten in the last two and a half years. Oh so, my god, um, that's a lot. <laughs> I guess, but you I really guess, went I, for it. Funny, I, I show with other artists that do even more than that. They do, they do like 15 a year or something. And That's, it's, I mean, they live off of that, but, right. um, but I certainly don't. I still have a full-time job. I, I wait tables oh, like okay. 30 hours a week, um, to pay the bills. Um, right. And that, that helps to take the stress off financially off my art. So I could just do whatever I want. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, like the conventions, uh, I think the most I've done in one year is four, um, which was last year. Mm-hmm. But this year I'm actually only doing one. I'm only doing WonderCon so I can finish my oh. book. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, you have. Yeah, we'll get into the book. You've you've got a Patreon. Yeah. You've got a book. <laughs> you've got all kinds of stuff going on. Um, but we'll get into that. Let's let's give people a little um, background on you. Like, um, let's let's. I you know how I usually start. I ask you if you're the art kid. Were you the art kid? Were you the art weirdo kid in school? Oh yeah, my sister and I have a twin sister, so right. it, was, <laughs> it was her and I would just be drawing. All oh, your sister, your and... sister also is an artist. Yeah, yeah, uh, we grew up drawing, t- drawing together, oh, and no way. Just, yeah, um, she took a break sometime in our I think teens or at least preteens, like and just didn't draw. Excuse me, didn't draw for a while, um, and uh, but I just kept going. It's what I've always wanted to do, and then she got back into it when we went to college because she wanted to go to the same college as me and. She studied fashion and I studied illustration. Oh, so we no have way. different interests, but we've always, you know, both been into art and stuff. So. Oh, that's so cool. What a trip. Twins are such a trip. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I say that as one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was I've, I have to ask you, I'm sure everybody asks you, but do you you, you, you have the, had the psychic thing nope. before? You no. haven't? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I you think don't have the, the closest... psychic link. 
No, I'm, oh. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but uh, wow, okay. Uh, we say stuff at the same time that's just completely random, like we'll and, and that will freak people out. That is just, and I guess that's the closest it can come okay. to some psychic link. But uh, but yeah, I've never like if she's in pain, I can't physically feel that. Okay. None of that. Interesting. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm sure you get asked that a lot, but <laughs> it what? is funny how uh, what whatever wherever that myth came from, it is a very pervasive. Myth, I've talked a lot of people... yeah I've talked to people who say that they've had that you know tw I've talked to other twins that say they have that but it's oh, wow. know, it's like it's not like every twin I imagine maybe some, right you know yeah everybody's different I wonder yeah I wonder where that comes from that's really creepy <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so you you uh, you uh you were you were the art kid you, you were the art kids both of you and um you went to Otis right Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. did you full on go and graduate and get a degree and all that stuff? I did. My sister wow. and I actually graduated a year early from high school because we just wanted to get out of there. Yeah, right. <laughs> like and uh, and so we started. We were I think we were sixteen when we were in art school and we were like the youngest ones there and everyone was like, oh my I don't God. know, we just felt like little kids <laughs> <laughs> in college. But yeah, we did the whole four year thing and um, actually was valedictorian in my class, which is oh my God. kind of insane. But uh, amazing. <laughs> But it, it's like it hasn't like that's the funny thing about art school is like the degree that has I've, no one's ever asked me for. It, right. You know? right. Just, <laughs> and I felt like I didn't even finish learning everything I wanted to learn. I feel like I just started scratching the surface. So, wow. Um, wow. People ask about the college thing all the time. Like, oh, like, you know, would you rec especially young kids? Like, should I go to college? And I feel like if I had started, if I had been of college age now, I probably would have just taken like workshops and like online classes right. and stuff like that because there's so much available but back then i mean this was 2003 i think that i started college okay. um there were no workshops online like right right um the only way to get skills like technical skills like painting and drawing skills was in a college and um and in even in um high school and grade school i never had any like art art classes with mm. teachers that actually <laughs> knew about art <laughs> it was like our, our high school principal who was also the gym teacher taught art <laughs> and oh he really to draw yeah. oh my god what, where <laughs> so, did you where did you grow up i grew up in like sunland tahunga area in california which a lot of people don't know where that is but it's um i guess nearish glendale la Cunada yeah, area yeah i know where that is um what what is that West LA uh, uh, Northwest LA Yeah <laughs> yeah it's a weird it's a weird netherland <laughs> Yeah very very suburban uh America kind of town, right. little yeah. town <laughs> Yeah yeah um Okay so uh yeah how, how was the I mean how was the did you like you liked college did you enjoy the experience I think I, I enjoyed most uh, just not being well. I enjoyed and hated not being the only artist because it was kind of scary at first. Just being, you know, you're you're the art kid in school. You're the only one. Right. And so there's there's like a there's something kind of nice about being special in that way. But then you go to art school and you're like, oh, I'm actually not special. Right, right. <laughs> there's all these people who are even better and stuff like that. So I think that at that time it was a bit intimidating, but also exciting because it felt like going to Hogwarts almost, like for artists. I know, and, right? Yeah. It seemed to me it seems like. Like thinking about art college now just seems like it would be so much fun. Like I, I have this fantasy that I could just drop everything and go to art college for four <laughs> yeah. years. That sounds like fun to me. If you yeah. get a bunch of really good teachers and just learn how to do all these things that maybe you've been slacking on all these years, you know? Totally. But totally. but but that that's that's uh, I'm surprised though that you uh, um, are so. Well, not not necessarily, but um, sorry, half form thoughts. Uh, it's just that <laughs> look, my, I had a friend who went to Otis in like the late '80s, so I guess things are were different then. But it mm -hmm. was it was very much like conceptual art, and oh, yeah. it, they didn't teach a lot of like technical skill uh, as far as like drawing and painting and figure drawing and stuff like that. So, so uh, but I, you you, you you must have yeah you must have gotten some good training in that way they must have changed then or, or I lucked out in the sense that there were a couple teachers that were really teaching that at the time because actually the year I think the year after me and the year after that we had a the, the chair changed and she was from a conceptual fine art background so that what I heard was from students like in the two classes after me that the, the conceptual stuff started taking over again oh really so I think yeah so I think around the time that I went we actually had 
uh, like Jim Auckland was one of my best teachers. Nathan Oda, who was in the oh, gallery yeah, scene, yeah, yeah. he taught me how him. to paint acrylics. Yeah, oh, cool. And, um, um, and Bob Dom, he's also in the gallery world. Oh, that's Those right. I forgot teachers. he. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah. He's, he's great. He's awesome. Yeah. Those three were like, you know, amazing. And, and of course, like actually in foundation year two, we had some real legit like life drawing teachers like Gary Gareth is one of them and Beverly Blood. So they they like traditional like um, foundational drawing skills and stuff. Um, but yeah, of course, there were definitely the mix of like conceptual art and stuff and some liberal stuff, liberal arts stuff. I don't think um a lot of artists would enjoy taking those classes you know <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> but it's like the degree requirements and stuff but i think overall like i i learned more than i would have if i had just tr tried to do it myself right. at that age because right. i was so clueless about anything about the world i was not i'm not very good at self-direction at least i wasn't then i think it kind of trained me to to learn you know right. and to to look for what are the skills that i want to pursue and i had a weird uh phase actually in art school where I was trying to get away from representational stuff because I I started really stylizing my work so actually if you look at my stuff that's like straight out of school it, it's really stylized really bold colors but like acid trip colors and wow interesting <laughs> and just very cartoony so oh um, that's weird I haven't yeah. I don't know if I've seen that that uh, work of yours <laughs> it's not on your website is is it that stuff no not anymore it's it was some of my first stuff like when I showed with the hive gallery actually that was the oh, first okay. gallery that ever showed me um, right uh, Nathan Cartwright was amazing mm -hmm. I had to give him a shout out and same with Elsie uh, from oh, yeah. space he had the cannibal flower Yep. shows that both of them gave me like my first chance and showing right out of school and yeah, uh yeah. so the stuff i did for for those kinds of shows was very very different from the stuff i do now <laughs> how funny how funny i was just trying to find my voice so. right yeah yeah it takes a while i was just talking to somebody i, I did a tattoo convention this weekend um uh, golden state tattoo which uh -huh. is nico yeah. nico hurtado's convention and you know talking to a lot of younger artists and um you know the question of how do you find your voice always comes up and it's just like it takes <laughs> it takes time you just have yeah. to keep messing around and and uh flailing and eventually mm -hmm. you find something that clicks you know it took me like five years i think i felt mm -hmm. like before i really yeah. got you know my thing my mo kind of monster portrait thing yeah but yeah, it's, definitely. it's just uh you know it's not like it's not like an intellectual thing mm -hmm. where it's like okay, what's my voice going to be? And you, you think about it and logically, you know, figure it out and then do it. It's not like that. It's, it comes no. from just repetition and develop, you know, it's a weird thing. It's very, it is. And if you're doing it that way, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's more like an intellectual, your intellectual voice or something. Yeah. So, okay. Um, you got, you graduated. Uh, yeah, that's, fu that's funny too about, um, getting a degree because there are, I, I used to work in the makeup effects business for, you know, before I got into fine art and that was the same thing uh, in that line of work as well. Like people, there were a few people that had art degrees and that was kind of the running joke is that nobody ever gets asked about if they have an art degree or not. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's not like anyone's ever gotten a job from it, but you know, it's like I, the skills speak for themselves. Yeah, so, exactly. You know. That you you know you're going there for the the way I see it. The, the degree is just the the little you know artifact from that experience, and and your what you learn is the important thing. Yeah, know? yeah, definitely. So, yeah, but it's crazy now. You can learn from YouTube for free. Yeah, oh there's my some gosh. amazing tutorials and stuff on there. Absolutely, really or for a small in. price. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah like exactly. Some of the subscriptions are a fraction of what a Art education costs is like a mm -hmm. hundred grand to go to college, and it's like loans and you know parents right. paying for shit and people working through college. I mean, it's like it's insane. But um, but yeah, I mean, I actually continued taking classes at workshops and stuff after graduating. Like that's smart. Um, any chance that I get or, yeah. or any of these subscription sites like New Masters Academy or Schoolism, yeah. like I'll sign up for like stints and just take a bunch of classes and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, that New Masters Academy is pretty amazing. I've I've thought about <laughs> it. I've almost. I mean, I'm. It's one of those things. It's like if I get a little extra money, I see I see courses all the time. I'm like, oh, I want to take that. Yeah. You know, because um, there's always so much to. There's always more to learn. Definitely. You know, yeah. it's not like you ever. I I remember talking to my dad about that when he was he was like uh telling me when he was 
70 that he was still learning, you know, and he'd been painting mm. since he was 20. So it's, yeah. that's why it's fun because it never, yeah. it's so hard. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so are you an acrylic painter? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yes. I'd that, like to try oil at some point. Uh, <laughs> doesn't look like you, I mean, if you're, if you're this good in, in acrylics, it doesn't, I don't know. I, 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 it's not like I look at your stuff and say, oh, that's acrylic. Or it just doesn't even register. It looks like a painting, just a really good painting to me, you know, so it's whatever you're comfortable with. It's it's true. I think that it's, it's funny that most of my favorite paintings are oil paintings, though. And so it's just there's certain things that mediums you can't, you know, make them. You can't force them to do something that a different medium does. So um, uh, I think sometimes I fight with acrylics a little bit. Maybe I'm I, I feel like I, I, I'm uh, in denial <laughs> about what it can do and what it can't <laughs> right. do. Um, even though I've been painting with it for um, over 10 years, I, I still feel like there's still things I can learn and to be better at. Like mm. Nathan Oda, for instance, he's a total master at it. And same with this artist that does work for Magic the Gathering, uh, Jesper. I don't think I'm saying his name right. Ising? Ising? Something uh, like that. But yeah. he's he's great with yeah. acrylics, too. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, it makes it just look so loose and, and effortless. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a it's there's um, amazing uh, acrylic artist. My as another thing, my dad told me grow, growing up. Also, he was always an oil painter, but he he would show me these. Uh, he showed me this guy Chuck Wren, who was an illustrator in the '70s, mm. who did all uh, acrylic, and they looked they looked like oil paintings. And he was he'd always tell me. I never really had that prejudice against acrylic. Um, because he he would tell me that you know you can it doesn't matter if you're good you can make whatever you're right, or, or, right. whatever medium you're using look amazing it doesn't matter yeah, exactly um, I started with acrylics because uh, uh, makeup effects was it's all like acrylic based usually oh, yeah you know we're painting uh, prosthetics and making this kind of um, this rubberized version of acrylic paint and so mm -hmm. I was really familiar with that uh, so I started with acrylics but then I all my favorite painters were oil painters. So I'm like, right. okay, I'm going to teach myself how to paint in oils. And it was hard at first. But once I got to the point where I learned how to paint in oils, I just, I just never went back to, to acrylic. Mm. And actually one time I did. And then, I, and then it, everything dr uh, was drying too fast for me. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> fuck this. I can't deal with it. It's drying on the palette. You know, I'm just not used to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you should try it. You, you know, it would be since you, you might want to try a good way maybe to try um, messing around with oils would be to uh, like finish your acrylic paintings in oil. Cause you know, you can paint uh, oil right. on, a, on a, like people like Brahm, I know, or a lot mm -hmm. of illustrators, they get it since it dries so fast, they get a painting like three half done or three quarters of the way done right. and then polish it off in oils. That's very true. You yeah. know, that might be a way. I don't know. <laughs> I definitely love to try it. I, I've taken, uh, I've done a few paintings in oil, but I feel like I still don't quite understand how, how to make it work. And mm. it's, I'm always just frustrated by the results, but I just need to like, uh, to really, really try it. <laughs> so yeah, just like yeah. a painting here or there, but yeah. Right. Yeah. The thing that got the, the, that made it all click for me was liquid was paint using liquid as a medium. Oh, okay. It, putting that just a little bit in every, every, every time I, put some paint in the canvas, you put a little bit of liquid in that way it dries overnight. So, okay. yeah, you know, the, it's dry the next day and you can go on to the next layer instead of waiting two weeks for it to dry or whatever, which is insane. Yeah, that is insane. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Wow. Interesting. Okay. So, um, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm just looking, no, looking, you're looking, looking at all your stuff on your website. I love the blues. You use a lot of cool colors. Yeah, it's it's a thing that I'm uh, I didn't notice I was into like the, but I have a very specific palette these days mm -hmm. that I just love kind of almost like a midnight palette or like at least a mm -hmm. yeah yeah a dusk palette if mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah. like I just there's something kind of fantastical about that that I really enjoy but yeah, I do I, need to step away and try other things too <laughs> I don't know it's working for you I mean it's I I like the I like it because it's very it looks spiritual to me like this oh, that cool. the those cool colors they just kind of feel like mysterious and spiritual kind of you know awesome. um okay so you graduate college then how, how did you i mean how did you get to the point where you're you're at now what did you do once you graduated college I, I was actually exhibiting in galleries like i started with the hive and and cannibal flower and stuff like that and then you know just group show to group show um with rock larue copro mm. uh cory halford and um 
around the time that I had my solo show with Corey Halford in 2012, um, I thought that was some of uh, my best work actually that I had done up till that time. I actually had never shot models before, like photographed models before to, mm. for my work. And so I felt like my work had leveled up and stuff and I was really excited about where it was going. Um, and I think it was just a combination of things happening. I had a lot of personal life things happen that really changed my life. Um, mm. as well as I think around that time, the economy too was shrinking a bit. Like right. there weren't as many collectors, um, as there were when I first started. Right. Um, and then, um, and yeah, and just, I think a combination of those things happening, honestly, like I was just in a bit of a fog at that point. So all that work up until that, that show was my more naturey kind of giant epic pieces with all these crazy details right. like the stuff I became known for and mm -hmm. stuff. And, um, during those days I actually lived with my parents. So I would paint for 14 hours a day and wow. just, I made, I, I basically, the income I made from my paintings, like paid for my living with my parents. So I didn't have any expenses, you know, it's like, but I also wasn't living on my own. Right. So when I decided to move out, I realized it was kind of like my first, uh, like reality check in terms of yeah. the life as an artist, like, Oh wow, this actually isn't going to work yeah. uh, financially. <laughs> yep. uh, so, uh, so it, it was a bit, of, a couple years of struggle and just trying to come to terms with the fact that I was changing as a person. So my art was changing mm. and my work wasn't selling as much as it had been at the same time mm -hmm. and I'm moving out and I need to figure something out financially right now. <laughs> yeah. Especially living in LA. Yeah. You know, it's insane. insane. I was actually, I moved to Orange County which is slightly cheaper, but still insanely expensive. Yeah. Yep. So, um, I actually made the, the choice, which at the time felt really tough. Cause I grew up, um, like all through college and everything, just thinking I'm going to be an artist and I'm going to be make a living as an artist. However, that, that right. turns out to be whether it's commercial art, whatever. Mm -hmm. My art was never really commercial, so I had a really hard time finding any art-related jobs. And during that sort of crisis moment, I realized actually my skills aren't where I want them to be. Like mm -hmm. I was just wasn't satisfied with where they were. Um, and a lot of jobs these days, commercial jobs these days, do tend to require you to paint digitally, or at least right. it makes it easier. And I definitely <laughs> don't have those skills, so um, I just decided to take a non-art job actually in mm -hmm. 2014 to pay the bills and. That was really tough, but it also wasn't the end of the world, which I right. thought it would be. Right, you know? right, it's, right. It's like when you first make that decision, you think, I'm not an artist anymore. It's like, yes, you are. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, so, it's funny. This this comes up a lot, um, yeah. this debate uh, on, 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 you know, forums and on Facebook and in, the, in art groups and on the podcast about, you know, the, the day job versus mm -hmm. full time and, um, you know, people, people being criticized for not being artists if they're not it's it's just it's such bullshit i mean i like i i it took me seven years working a day job the last seven years of my day job i was doing b building my art career and i and i yeah. and and um even at the end of that seven years i was not quite ready but but i got laid off and so i was like okay I, i'm almost to that point where i, I can do this but i don't know i like i almost went and got another shop job in effects mm -hmm. when i got laid off um, but, but some guy bought a painting like that mm. day. So I was like, okay, nice. that's, a, that's a sign. You know, I took it as a sign that I should do this and I was able to make it work, but man, it's like, this is, you know, I've been busting my ass ever since <laughs> how yeah. many, it's like, uh, uh, I don't know, seven, seven years, maybe I've just been wow. cranking, yeah. working every day, mm -hmm. seven days a week so yeah. that I could be, you know, uh, living off of my artwork and it yeah. and like i said it took seven years to transition mm -hmm. um so it's 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 smarter it's often smarter to have a have a day job for a while to take the pressure off especially if you know you you, you want to build a body of work or or if you can, yeah. you can get some flexibility with your job or it's not mm -hmm. like an 80 hour a week job or exactly. something you know yeah and it and sounds like you I, have that yeah yeah, yeah, serving is is definitely great because it's like yeah, last week I made my a week's pay in three days because I had really great tips that week. Right. So I took the rest of the week off, which is nice. Oh, really? I had four. Yeah, I just had four days to work on art and stuff. Excellent. And it's just, I love <laughs> that flexibility, and it's just not having nine to five have to be there no matter what. Right. You know, right. Like, um, that definitely helps. Um, it's not as high pay maybe as a nine to five, but it's like it, it's it's gives you, you freedom. Know, it's gives you some my, freedom. Yeah, and it gets me by. Um, but yeah, I think that. You're totally right that it's like there's there's a stigma for some reason about or maybe it's not necessarily a stigma, but it's just 
I think artists for the most part don't consider themselves successful unless they're making, you know, like living the dream is right. to live off your art, but it's like at the same time, not everyone's temperament or maybe like right. mental health wise, you know, at that time in your life, like you have to protect right. yourself first. And, and I w was not in a position at that time to, to force that to happen. Um, and the same too, like what we're talking about, you never stop learning, you never stop studying, you know, to be an artist. I think that's something that's hard too. the public people who aren't artists, like lay people don't really understand how many hours that takes, you know, how many years right. that takes to get in a certain place. And yet that isn't really, you know, you still have to pay the bills and none of that stops. And yeah, so right. <laughs> all of that makes it really complicated for sure. But I think the sooner people can just throw that idea out the window that there's no shame in no. just taking a step back when, when you need to, it's just a season in your life. I think that's what got me through it. I was just like, this is not forever. Right. Right. It's maybe more years than I'd like it to be, but it's, it's not going to be like this for the rest of my life. Right, nothing, right. nothing is the same for the rest of your life. Exactly. So. Yeah. 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 It was the same way that that's how I kind of got through those years in effects when at that point I was like, just not into it anymore. I just, I, you know, for a lot of different reasons, I was like, oh, I got to yeah. get out of this job. It was, making me insane. But, uh, that's what I kept telling myself the whole time. It's like, it's not permanent. It's not permanent. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I'll be able to do this. I just gotta, you know, you, you see the growth. I was able to kind of slowly watch the growth of my career go. And I'm like, okay, as long as it keeps going up, even yeah. if it's slightly, um, I can, I can deal with this, this day job and, yeah. uh, and it's, yeah. And it's, and it, and it afforded me the ability to do that, to create artwork. It was like, I was working at night and on weekends, but still, you know, yeah. I, was, I was able to do it. Um, yeah. so yeah, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's a, it's a weird thing, but you know, it's, it's uh, you just have to make choices, you know, in life and it's, right. you know, you, you sometimes think, did I make the wrong choice? And it's like, you won't ever know that you just make a choice and, yeah, then, you exactly. go with it, and then you make another choice and then the worst <laughs> things thing you, will work out. Yeah. The worst <laughs> thing you can do is not make a choice and just mm -hmm. sit there and be like, uh, the best, you know, you have to at least make it some choice. Yeah. You, you can't sit I mean? on a sinking ship and expect things to just get better. Right. Like, and that's how I felt at that point. I was like, I can't just keep doing this because it's not, you know, it's like, it just felt like diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I have to change things. And actually around that time is when I got the idea for my Alice in Wonderland project that I'm working on right now. Yeah. It was like back in 2013. So around oh, really? the middle of all that. Mm -hmm. Wow. That long ago. Well, I guess the very original uh, idea of that, the pre-infancy <laughs> like idea of that was in college. It was my senior year and I did this uh, sort of Alice inspired kind of uh, more, I guess, North African take. Um, but it was not Alice in Wonderland. It was my nonsense story that had come up with um, very different designs and stuff like that. But it was I had just taken an African art class that year. And it was one of my liberal arts classes. And it just struck me. I was just looking at this imagery and these costumes and these people and this music and everything and I'm just like how is this not in a fantasy world and mm -hmm. uh, like I was just such a huge Lord of the Rings fan and that kind of world building and I think every kid that year that movie came out was trying to come up with their own Lord of the Rings rip off or something all right because <laughs> <laughs> um, I certainly was and that but then I was thinking like why why does it have to be in Europe why can't it be in Africa or right. in, you know in South America or wherever else that we haven't seen fantasy epics um, as much and so I think that was just like a, an idea in the back of my head ever since I did that project in, in uh, art school mm -hmm. and I put it aside till 2013 and um, kind of started playing with that again and it turned into what I'm working on right now. So. Yeah. So, so th are you doing that through your, your Patreon kind of, or is that sort of um, the idea is that you're, you're exclu are you kind of exclusively focusing on that project through your Patreon and sharing the process or or is it, or is the Patreon just kind of for whatever you're doing? The Patreon was started for that project, actually. Yeah, okay. and it's like I'm sure when I finish it, I'll still, I'll probably start another thing, and and we'd be, you know, working through that. But yeah, it is. Uh, I share uh, just with my patrons get to see pretty much all of the process of this, the creation of this book be between character designs and just world building and my ideas for the characters and stuff like that and um process for each painting um but yeah i just wanted a place to kind of have like a visual diary of creating this mm -hmm. project since it's going to be <laughs> it looks like it's going to be about 200 pages of writing and like yeah. over 30 paintings and it's just a very involved project and i don't know i just I, I think for the first few years it was just by myself in my head in my studio not sharing with anyone right 
And when I started doing conventions and seeing people respond to it and saying, wow, I can't wait to read this, I started realizing there's actually kind of an audience for this. Um, and I want to, sh- and I enjoyed that process of sharing with people, at least the finish. But, um, so Patreon is kind of an extension of that, but mm-hmm. getting to, um, share it along the way, like the process along right. the way of, of building the story and stuff like that. So isn't it, it's, it's, isn't, isn't it great? Isn't Patreon I amazing? I love it so much. It's oh, really man. an incredible concept. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I, I got in this big argument with some guy the other day about, about, uh, patreon and it's like some people fucking hate it like they 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 think like you're, like you're begging or oh, oh i have gosh. to i have to pay for the right to to i have to pay for the the right to you know buy your see work your or to see your <laughs> stuff and it's like you know you're not getting this and so i was trying to explain and this guy was just being kind of a dick about it but uh most people are i, I think it's it's kind of a newer concept in a way. It's really not because it's a patronage model, which has been yeah. the oldest, uh, oldest tradition in art history. Mm-hmm. It's patronage. Exactly. Uh, it's just you know, uh, there's you're just getting smaller amounts from more people, and yeah. you know, it's amazing, 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 like life saving kind of thing. Totally. And um, yeah, I, I wonder if those same people think that Netflix is begging. <laughs> then it's like they only people who have a Netflix subscription can watch those shows. Is that begging? No, it's right. like you're paying to see. You're paying, so you get to see this. Content, I know it's you know? weird. I don't. It's yeah, so weird. it's weird. It's it's weird. It's like I don't, you know. I know. I know other artists too that that feel that way. It's not, you know, it's not the the majority don't feel that way. But it bothers me when people say that because it's just that's it's wrong. It's not. It's yeah. not what it is. You know, and and um. I find that a large uh, chunk of the people supporting me are just doing it to support me. Like they're mm-hmm. not even checking the page, really. Yeah. I actually, I've got some people that have signed up and don't even want any of the rewards that I right. offer. It's because they just – and I was thinking, you know, when I was kind of arguing with this guy, I was sort of thinking about the whole thing, how I was going to word it. And it got me thinking, um, like if if there was like a Frazetta Patreon while he was mm-hmm. alive or a Giger Patreon, fuck, I would be – Oh yeah. So happy. Even if I didn't check up check on it to to mm-hmm. give him a buck or 5 bucks right. a month to just help bring that amazing work to into the world for everyone. Yeah. I mean Yeah, definitely. It's it's, it's ridiculous. But your your uh your feed's great. I love oh, w- watching your stuff. Yeah, your stuff's so good. Um, thanks. Yeah, so- I wish I had more time. That I think that's the hard thing too is like finding time to uh to share more. I think just with my day job it gets tough. Right. But it's like I just I, I'm so grateful that people are you know are on the page. I want to give them more. Right. And I, I feel know. like I'm never giving enough. You know. Yeah. And it's just, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's like when I went on vacation, I actually had queued like posts like twice a week so that oh, they cool. had continued content and stuff. I was just like. I, I don't want them to feel like I'm just going on vacation and forgetting about them. You right, know? Like, it's just, right. Just stuff yeah. like that. So <laughs> Yeah, because I, I, I feel like uh with the with the patrons, I feel like um I feel like I owe them. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. That's that's it's so cool that they're doing that. It's and it really is kind of hard to get people over there. Because mm-hmm. this is kind of a new it's a new way of doing things. Um so man, I really uh, value them so much i i they're they're kind of like my first consideration to people that are willing to even and it's so it's such a, sp- a small amount in many cases like a dollar i still feel yeah like an too. obligation to those people that are just willing to put a dollar a month because it's like absolutely you know, i remember what it was like to be like wow i have 20 bucks in my bank and then my <laughs> bank account that isn't going somewhere wow right you know, like, so a dollar is a big deal I know, you know? right it's like every month heck yeah so i i mean that wasn't too long ago <laughs> right. <laughs> but you, uh, you, you, you know, um, do you know, um, uh, Jasmine Beckett? Yeah. Griffith, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You got it. She's Insane. You know how much money she's making on there. I have not checked, but I can only imagine. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you, you see the potential there to, oh, to really, yeah. you know, to live off your own work, to live off yeah. your art, you know? But like people say too, like, I don't think it's the type of thing. A lot of people say, should I start a Patreon and stuff? And I know a lot of people snagged accounts before it changed over to the paid account and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. I, I have found it is hard to build an audience there if you don't already have one. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It's like, like they say, they say it's not a discovery platform. Right. Like YouTube. Yeah. It's, it's like a hosting platform. So you have to bring the people exactly. to it, you know? So you have yeah, to, yeah, yeah it's it, the, the better thing to tell people would be, 
build your fan base up first, then mm-hmm. start the Patreon. Or you can you can't have the Patreon yeah. up, but you're not going to make any money until you get your right. fan base and then bring right. them over. There's a whole big absolutely thing trying to get people over there you know it's <laughs> it's, it's not easy yeah. but um but it's great actually, that's what's so great about conventions too is that i think that when you make that face-to-face connection with people right. it is easier to convince them to support you like you're saying um i think online uh, i think something with social media it is great that so many millions of people get to see your work but for a lot of them it is just content you know and right. it's not a connection it's yeah, not exactly yeah like getting to shake your hand and look in your eyes right. while you're telling them about what the piece meant right. and you know your inspiration like that is such a it's, a, it's something that can't be replaced by yeah, social media yeah, I think. yeah for sure yeah i just did this like i said i did the convention this weekend and um it was like financially it's all right it didn't mm-hmm. make a ton you know it was okay but but and this is true for every convention i do no matter how much money i make there there's always the value of meeting fans face to face and talking Mm. to them and making Mm -hmm. that connection and seeing how excited they are about your work. And then you giving that, you know, telling them information and seeing their work, if they're artists as well. I mean, that's like priceless kind of stuff. And and that, as far as, you know, even from a business standpoint, as far as the, the business of art is concerned, you know, those are the kind of people that support you. They'll be supporting you for your whole life. You yeah. know, when the people that you make those real connections with, you know, mm-hmm. you're not just like some uh, little post on, on Instagram that's going by with, every, you know, thousands of other people. Absolutely. So, you know, just just the just the connection factor is, is important for, mm-hmm. you know, reasons for doing con- conventions, I think. Yeah, definitely. You know? And uh, I don't know that the, they're the, the, the more I the older I get, the longer I do this, the more I'm. I see that it is those those people are the ones that that are always there for you, even during Mm -hmm. the bad economic times. They'll support you throughout all that stuff. That's where it's at. It's, you know, the the real hardcore people, you know, but yeah, anyway. So so the the basic idea of of your um, your Alice in Wonderland project is it's like you're re envisioning the, the concept of Alice in Wonderland in a in like an African kind of context. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's actually also a sister story. So Alice has a sister in the original, but she's just reading her a story that Alice falls asleep to. Mm-hmm. And then when Alice wakes up from her wonderland adventures, her sister's there saying, and she tells her, so she's kind of like a, like a, like a bookend character. She's mm-hmm. not really a part right. of the plot. Um, and me being a sister, I just felt like what if her sister is part, uh, at least has a bigger part in the story. And, um, Alice has to choose between staying behind in a world that doesn't understand her to be with her sister in a world that she's going to not be happy in Mm. or go out into Wonderland alone. Oh, interesting. Um, And I can completely relate to that because I went through something similar. Um, And yes, it is set in a West African world. And so I'm, I'm created a whole culture that she's from that doesn't exist, but I want it to feel like it could exist. But that's part of the fantasy element and stuff. And it's just, I've been, you know, just doing a lot of research and making sure I, um, you know, create something that's not only respectful, but also um, exciting and fun and something just different that maybe is, you know, when you think of Alice in Wonderland 2, it's such a Western story, such a totally. British story. So I'm trying to make some of these elements like the Mad Tea Party or Croquet and stuff like this. Like, why is this still in this world? Right. And so in my version of the story, it's, uh, you know, uh, European colonists tried but failed to colonize the African continent. So there's a bunch of buried, you know, expedition garbage, including tea sets and books and all those kinds of stuff. And the Queen of Hearts actually takes this stuff and uses it to tyrannize Wonderland. So her whole court is very like 18th century costumes and stuff like that. That's and, amazing. Uh, that way, like, you know, everyone in Wonderland is sort of oppressed by her. And uh, um, and that sort of ties in at least the Western element in a that's more so twisted cool. fashion. So it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Thanks. It's yeah. a lot of fun. I, I just, <laughs> it sounds like it'd be a ton of fun. I just want to fun. live in this world. And yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so have you written before or is this like a new thing for you or what? This sounds like a major, a lot of writing. <laughs> it know? is a lot of writing. I, I grew up writing and illustrating. I actually oh, remember cool. when I was a little kid, I was like, I want to be an author and an illustrator. Oh, and wow. I'd write my own little stories and stuff with my art and 
I think I, st- I stopped writing, unfortunately, after college because I had a terrible experience with a teacher that got like way too personal. He's trying to make my art, my writing super personal and I got really uncomfortable. Oh, wow. Weird. And actually it turned me off from writing, unfortunately, for like 10 years. Mm. So I kept writing sort of on the side, just like, you know, thoughts and stuff, but not actual stories. And so this is actually getting me back into it because um, I wanted to start with an adaptation and see what I could do with that before right. maybe pursuing more of my original ideas. But so yes and no, like, like I don't have, I'm trying to like kind of make up for the lost time, mm-hmm. I guess. But yeah, these last several months, I've just been doing almost like nothing but writing. Like my <laughs> social media page has just got nothing new because I'm just <laughs> writing this whole time. Um, but I'm at like a hundred pages now out of 200. Wow. So wow. Almost there. <laughs> do, do you have a, like an editor or anyone helping you? That's, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a writer. <laughs> I love mm-hmm. reading. I've always been a big reader, but I'm not yeah, a writer. Um, but uh, I know that, you know, writers usually have editors that kind of go mm-hmm. through and yeah. do you have an editor or is that something you're going to maybe have or? I'm definitely going to have an editor for sure. I have some, some close friends, luckily that are writers or and a writing teacher friend as well that offer to, to read oh, my good, draft good. for me and stuff, which is great. And some fans at conventions that offered themselves said I'm a copy editor you know oh, or, or whatever cool. or something they just offered themselves to, and so that's the best like when it's a fan that's interested in the story and right. they want to to help out I mean so I'm definitely going to be I already sent some of them emails just saying you're, you're I'm going to be sending you some writing and and pretty soon so <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so we'll see but um but yeah after I think after I get some preliminary eyes like that on it I definitely want to pursue like a professional editor and stuff like that for sure right how exciting do you, are you just kind of going and going doing it and and do you have a, de- a deadline or is it just sort of like you don't know you're just kind of working on it when you can or I keep giving myself deadlines that <laughs> doesn't work does it <laughs> because of my day job and I've, <laughs> I've been giving myself deadlines on my book for four years <laughs> right that's what it feels like for me is just like I, I've never done something like this before so I can I can guess it might take a year and a half or two years but I really don't know and so it's just when I say, if I've said a time to anyone at a show, I just want to apologize and say it was a very loose, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> a very loose estimate because I've, I've never done a project like this. But to me, I just don't want to rush it. Um, it's, it's all I'm working on, like literally all I'm working on. But it's, it's also not something I'm interested in rushing because I've been working on it for right. years. You don't have um, to either. Yeah, I don't want to compromise right. the quality. Um, this and... may be this may be the only time that, that you have that you have yeah. that much freedom and and time to, you know, yeah. to do that. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. Cuz definitely. Like they say with bands, you know, you have your your whole life to write your first album and then you have 6 months to write <laughs> your your next album and your next album. It's you know, once you get success at it, it's, you know, you have to do things quicker, but yeah. so yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just looking at the the work on your Patreon um, and not knowing the background really of what you were doing, just because I'm, you know, I I, I see it in the feed when I post. I, I support a lot of uh, um, Patreon accounts just because you know I like the artists or the friends, and just because I want to support that whole thing. Yeah. And um, uh, your stuff though really sticks out from this series. It's like it's just just without knowing anything about it, it's like they're striking really great, excellent, excellent, um, excellent drawing skills, you know, and, and, and painting yes. skills. So it's, it looks, it just immediately kind of, um, drew me into it without knowing anything about it. So I think it's going to be pretty amazing. Thank you so much. I, yeah. I really appreciate that. It's exciting. It's a cool project. I think it's, it's cool to hear about it. Like, wow, this is really, you know, even cooler <laughs> than I was thinking. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. I'll have to pick your brain eventually. I, I was thinking of kickstarting it when it, it's done, but it's, uh, yeah, just, I've heard so many, I don't know. I'm just intimidated by the idea of Kickstarter in the sense of, um, it's stressful. It's a stressful 30 days, but it's, it's worth doing. You just have to do it right. Yeah. Definitely. Um, talk to me before you do it. Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've done them. I've done them wrong a few times. Yeah. I'm like I said, I'm still paying for it with this dystopia book, but, um, yeah, yeah, it's like you can't. Yeah, just let me. That's know. a whole nother job. <laughs> yes, in and of itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the rewards can be great. You know, it could be. I think something your book would be would do really well. That that would be really. Uh, you you'd be able to come up with the money for it. I think, uh, especially you'll have all this work done to show. You know. Yeah, it's the hope. I mean, I guess just either way, if it's um, 
I would just want to have it. I, I can't wait for the day when it's a, a book in my hands. Like to me, that I that's know. little little Mia's dream come true would be to do that. Right. <laughs> to have that. I know. I'm with you. It's little Chetty's dream too <laughs> to have my book done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's gonna happen this year. I've got. I've, I've, um, awesome. Yeah, it's it's gonna happen. The first, it's it's getting done now. But that's exciting. Yeah, really exciting. It's it's been so stressful. But um, yeah. So how was uh, how was the the Corey Helford experience? Because that's like a big when you do a Corey Helford show. It's kind of a big show, right? It is. Yeah. I I don't know. I feel like very imposter syndrome about that part of my life because I felt like I was. I was too young and uh, didn't know anything about anything at that time of my life. And right. I, I, when I think back, it just feels surreal. Like, how did how did I get that? But how the, was I the there? show itself was, you know, uh, the show. Yeah, the show was incredible. It, honestly, like, good I good experience still have, and yeah, absolutely. It was a very magical night. Just to, I think, seeing your work on the walls of a gallery and yeah. just knowing that 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 month is for your art. There's something so magical about that for sure. I think that is. I think a lot of artists dreams for sure. And I just feel very fortunate to have had that once in my life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I did also learn that it's, uh, I did not plan financially at that time when I was, I literally was living in a, in an unrealistic world. And I, I think I kind of took for granted what I had in the sense that, uh, I treated it almost like it was like I was a hobby artist that people happened to be buying my work. And I was, I, you know, I wasn't making any business decisions or thinking about, how I would, I didn't save up for a solo show that would take me months and months of unpaid work to do. Right. And then if it didn't sell out, which it didn't, you know, like how would I pay for that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're <laughs> just like so happy to have a sh- big I show. Was just, exactly. Right? I was just like, I'll make paintings. Sure. It was just so, <laughs> <laughs> so not realistic. And that's how I got into debt, actually, is I lived off of credit cards for that entire year that I was making that show. And I'm still, and then, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm there. I'm there as well. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, st- I, you know, starting my business in the, the, you know, the early 2000s, it's like, I started on credit cards. I'm still yeah. paying on those, you know. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It yeah. took me seven years to pay them off. I paid yeah. them off last year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just like, I mean, I guess it was a great lesson to learn too, just because mm-hmm. money you don't have, like, and, and and just every every penny you make not still not being enough, like that was something that I will never forget for oh, sure. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, I, I feel like, you know, I look back fondly on those days in the sense of, like I said, it just felt so surreal. Uh, it was definitely a magical night to see all my friends there and mm-hmm. to see my work on the wall um, and stuff like that. And, and, and you know, also I think it was humbling that I thought that was some of my best work up until that point and that yeah. it still didn't, you know, didn't save me at that time because right. of financial reasons and stuff like that. And I yeah. think that's that was a good lesson to learn too, that it's like you have to keep pushing. You have to keep doing better keep evolving you know as an artist mm-hmm. and stuff and that's what i've done ever since so. and and you have to have a thick develop a thick skin Definitely. you know because you know i've had all kinds of shows where i didn't sell mm-hmm. shit you know and it's right you know you believe in the work everything everything you mm-hmm. do you believe in yeah and it's just it's a it's a it's a bummer Absolutely. <laughs> and things don't keep going in an upward tra- trajectory, too. It's like it might be sold out mm-hmm. show, sold out show, and then it's like there's a dip. And I think that's great to learn because it's like yeah. success is not an upward, you know, yeah. trajectory at yeah. all. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it it goes up, but it goes down. You know, it's yeah. like, a, it's like exactly. a, you know, one of those financial like financial graphs, graphs. you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but, yeah. so it's like you have to you have to try and prepare mentally and emotionally for, you know, that feeling of, you know, Oh, I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't a hit this time, you know, yeah. and, and yeah. it's part, it's part of it's every artist goes through it. Every artist yeah. goes through it. And if you haven't gone through it, you will go through it eventually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it would, it would, you know, there might be a rare case where someone just kind of comes out of the gate and is just hugely successful, but usually those people, you, they don't last that long. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of artists that were like kind of, you know, a year or two into it, just got really popular, and then they, and then they kind of, you don't hear about them anymore. You know, yeah. it's it's a it's a uh, it's actually a it's better, it's a better career trajectory to have that slow build and mm-hmm. the ups and the downs. It's natural, you know. Yeah. So you just have yeah. to 
prepare yourself for the pain because that that will come. Cause it's, Absolutely. Because it's part of it. It's just part yeah. of the journey, you know. It doesn't skip anyone. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh yeah it's very um, non discriminating in that way. You know, it doesn't awesome. doesn't matter how good you are, it's gonna happen. Yeah, I feel like I have a healthier relationship with my art now after all that happened too. That it just. I, I feel like I can take criticism better. Mm. I can look at my work critically and see what I'm missing, what I need to right. improve. And back then I was just, this is my work. This is how it's done. It was very, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was interesting. I just was very close-minded at that time of my life. And I feel like the struggles I've been through have helped me actually be a bit more satisfied with right. the journey, with the journey in general and not where I am currently. Right. So. Well, you were you were pretty young. Yeah, yeah. I at think that was time. 20 in my early 20s yeah, yeah that's like still a kid yeah you know i mean yeah. that's, that's 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 pretty young <laughs> so and, and um you know uh humility and 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 being able to take criticism and stuff like that that comes with age you know that's like mm-hmm. one, one of the good things about getting older is is that you don't take things so personally and Definitely. you realize you're not the most amazing thing in the world and you're not special and there's all kinds of amazing talented people out there and you know it's 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 just part of growing up so um yeah. you know it's it's the painful lessons of growing up everyone goes through them yeah absolutely especially artists <laughs> especially artists <laughs> but yeah uh, i don't know it's cool it's 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 i i i hopefully people j- uh, join your patreon from this podcast too because this stuff is really really good i enjoy it you're one of my Thanks favorite so feeds on there um yeah i enjoy it thank uh, you yeah so you're just mainly working on um you don't have any shows lined up or you just kind of stepped away from the the gallery scene after that or what um not not exact entirely i think i did group shows pretty much every year like mm. after that so at least one or two pieces um like last year i did a piece uh, for spoke arts game of thrones show for the the last season of game of thrones and oh cool that was pretty fun um mm-hmm. getting to do that but um but yeah actually this year i have no shows lined up just WonderCon because uh that show you're grandfathered into so if you give up one year like your, your right. space you actually don't get it the next year right on every other show, every other convention is juried. So it doesn't matter if you skip a year because it's a different oh, jury every okay. year anyway. So um, for me, that's convenient because WonderCon's in my backyard. It's the easiest show for me where, to do. Where is WonderCon? It's, it's, it's at Anaheim, Anaheim Convention Center, like right by Disneyland. Oh, okay. Okay. How is it? I've never been to that one. It's pretty good. I mean, I've, it's not as much money as I've made at other shows, but I think that it's, I think I've had a steady, like this is going to be my fourth year, I think. Yeah, so I've had like, return people coming back and and mm. th- la- this last year was my best yet so i feel oh, like good. it's been it's been going better each year so for me it's worth doing because the costs are very low but I, I still don't recommend it to my friends who fly out of town yeah. uh, to, because it's i think to fly out of town for a show it has to at least have i don't know close to a hundred thousand people i think maybe WonderCon does have that but i think because it competes with disneyland being right across the street as a money sink I, I think uh, it still doesn't have the, you know, unless you do fan art and that sort of stuff. For people right. who do more like original work, you need a show that, that people are looking for that yeah. and that doesn't have such a direct competition like something like Disneyland that, you know, everyone who's going to WonderCon is also going to go to Disneyland. They're right. the same audience, you know? Right. So that would be my main criticism about the show. But um, they're run by the same people as San Diego. So, oh, really? Um, yeah. 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 Uh, so what about are you doing um designer con now that they moved down to you i did it the first year they did and i did not have a i shared a a booth to just sort of um to take the cost down and it was not great to be honest like uh yeah Yeah, i've I've heard it was yeah i heard it was like a lot of space in between booths and stuff Mm -hmm. or there's like it was weird i heard it was kind of weird but you know i guess that's to be expected maybe yeah a new move but I, I think they just sold more uh, more tables than they did tickets, basically, and that's oh, never right. good. Yeah, yeah, that's not a good thing. <laughs> you want the buyers to be to like far exceed the number of of booths there. Yeah. <laughs> so there's enough to yeah. spread around, but um, I think I'll wait a few years. I'm sure they're not going anywhere, you know, and they they can only get better with time. So. Right, right. 
I think I'll just wait it out. But that's something I've learned too, just from doing 10 shows. I don't know how my friends do it. They do 15 shows a year and that sort of thing. I but can't it's even like, imagine that. It's so exhausting. It's oh, so it's much time, so much preparation. And it's so physically draining the days of the show to be there that oh, to yeah, me, it's, it's like <laughs> the only way I will invest in doing that and doing a show and invest all the money to do one is if I know for sure um, I, I can find an audience there and I'm right. going to make money there just from what other people have said. So right. I'm, I'm just like not going to try like gambling on shows anymore. So yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just not worth my time. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's uh, I, I stopped doing, I, I stopped doing designer con when they moved because Pasadena is mm-hmm. like right 15 minutes from me. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, it's how can you not do a show that's 15 minutes from you? But um, yeah. I and I always had good luck there, but man, I, it's like I would have to either drive home, you know, an hour or, or whatever, or stay at a yeah. hotel, and that cuts into your your profit. And yeah, that really I don't kinda, think it's worth it. Yeah, yeah, it, it kind of bummed me out that they moved because I really liked that convention. But um, I got Monster Palooza I do, and and Nico's convention in Pasadena too. I mean, awesome. I'll do just about any convention in Pasadena. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. But they are they're so exhausting. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have you have to just talking for people like us that are not necessarily extroverts, it's all mm-hmm. takes so much energy even though you it appreciate doesn't. the people there and you're happy, you know, I'm happy to talk to people. It still mm-hmm. it just drains you. I slept yeah. 11 hours last night because sun- <laughs> the show ended last night. I slept 11 hours this- last night and it was like, you know, I could barely get myself out of bed. It's just, especially, the, yeah. you know, I'm getting old now. So it's like the older you get, the more, the more it takes out of you. It's harder to Absolutely. do. My back's all and, fucked up. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm short. I have to stand up because I can't see over my display. All right. Down, so my feet are killing me. By the end. <laughs> you need like a, a director's chair or one of those chairs that like lifts you up. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I know some people actually do bring those. Yeah. Uh, some people with director's chairs. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. But that's something actually serving has helped me with too. I used to be like when I first met you, I, I was super shy. Like mm-hmm. I was like super awkward. And um, I mean, there's certain people that I could easily talk to you, but like you, you're super nice and stuff like that. But there's other people that I just found intimidating or just strangers in general, just right. not knowing what to say. Right. Um, and yeah, just my day job forcing me to talk to strangers all day long. is just like, now I can just right. do that pretty easily. Yeah, so. yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I can imagine. Because you're, you're talking to like all, the, you're not just like talking to art fans. You're mm-hmm. talking to just every different type of person in that kind of job, yeah. I imagine. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that made me feel like, I, I feel like people's skills are literally a skill. Like you can learn it if oh, you yeah. want to. It's mm-hmm. going to be super uncomfortable if you're introverted, but you can totally learn how to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's the, I've, I've talked about that a lot on the podcast, like how I, I, um, I knew that that if I was going to make it, as an artist, one of the things I had to do was network with people and get over this whole fear of talking to people. Mm -hmm. And so I just started making myself go to art shows and talking to people. And then, you know, once you start doing it, then it becomes more, more, uh, natural. It feels more natural, but it's absolutely a hundred percent this learned thing. Yeah. Like a skill. It really is like a skill. And I think I, I think my fear originally, and maybe most introverts too, is that you think the person is that that you're talking to is looking at you, and right. like paying attention to you, and it's like they're actually, um, if you change this, uh, like make it more about them, you shift mm-hmm. the focus to them, it actually becomes less intimidating right, because they're true. not fixated on you, and mm-hmm. they're become more engaged because people love talking about themselves, yeah, they're yeah, talking they're about right. <laughs> things that you know when you make a make that connection i think that's maybe the hardest part because you're like i don't know them i don't right. know if this will click right. but um but yeah i think it com- becomes kind of fun to just see what's the thing that will land or what's the thing it, with art it's easy because they might point out something and then you can ask a question right. and then from there i think that it's exciting when somebody connects with something in your work right, um, right. but when you feel judged obviously it becomes really hard to to feel like you can bridge that gap but it's 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 so funny. It's just a, it's a small little snap that happens where you feel like this bridge that felt like miles mm-hmm. away right. from another person is suddenly, you know, completely eliminated. And I find that really fun, actually. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, it feels good to be able to 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 be that way now. Like I was so painfully shy when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Like I hated, you know, uh, paying for something at a liquor store when I was a kid. Candy, yeah. 
I'd yeah. be I would be shy about that. I didn't like anything to do with that, <laughs> or, or or answering the phone or talking to a stranger or something. Yeah. And and it's and it's like it's kind of liberating when you finally get over that. It's like it's funny. It took me to be you know get in my thirty be in my thirties to where I, where I was able to get over it. And it's like. You know, it's still, it feels good though. It's like, ah, oh, finally, yeah. that's such a burden. It's such a it's burden. It's such a huge weight off your shoulders. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. It's, and, and then, and the, the other thing is too, when you, you realize that, um, you know, everybody, I, when I was at this convention the other day, I was looking, just kind of watching just, you know, hundreds of people, thousands of people just walking around. It's like, everybody's in the same situation as you. Everybody mm-hmm. feels insecure. Everybody's kind of putting on an act that everybody, you know, you do, uh, you know, everybody, yeah. you have this persona that you, how you present yourself. It's part mm-hmm. of being a human being. Absolutely. Everybody's kind of playing this game. So it's, and it's not, it's not something you have to take so personally or so seriously. It's like everybody's yeah. insecure and everyone's thinking, worried what the other people are thinking. And and, and when you, and you realize it's like, everybody's kind of full of shit sort of (laughs) you know no one has anything figured out no one knows what the fuck's going on really you know (laughs) and so it's like you start to go you know we're all in the same boat here so there's no really any reason to be nervous about it because you know it's it's when you start thinking that other people know more than you Mm -hmm. and you're like you know everybody nobody knows anything uh, really about you know life it's all facade totally (laughs) So <laughs> I think I totally agree. And I feel like if you look at it, I, for me, it's amusing to people watch. Like when I'm mm-hmm. during the slow parts where like no one's buying anything, you can take that and say, oh, I suck. You know, like my work, no one cares about this shit, you know, or mm-hmm. whatever. But I just like I'm like, I just want to watch this person react to this or that. And it's just like I just find it super just interesting to watch. It people. is I'm like. Like you said, when you notice that we're all the same, I'm just like, I can totally see what that person's going right, through. And I'm not right. even talking to them. I love that stuff. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's also yeah, it's... one thing I was talking to my, my friend Lee. You know Lee Shamel? Do you know Lee? I don't think so. Oh, he's a oh. super cool guy. Great guy. Yeah. Um, he he was helping me with the booth, and I was talking to him um, about people watching and how it's so interesting when you catch people at certain moments where they don't think anybody's looking at them, how their, <laughs> their whole added physical attitude changes. Like, especially at tattoo conventions, you've got, everyone's kind of like, you know, dressed up to impress because it's mm-hmm. all about, uh, beautifying their bodies and, and, mm-hmm. and, you know, tattoos, it's like decoration. So everyone dresses up all, you know, nice or sexy or whatever. And everyone's kind of walking around and, and, and you catch people when they don't think that anyone's looking at them <laughs> just for a moment, sometimes it's just a second and you can see like this, you know, what's kind of like a well-composed, beautiful uh, young woman walking by and you, and you catch them in a moment. And all of a sudden, instead of being, you know, po- have this certain poise, it's like they're, you know, for a split second, you could see them kind of like awkward and gangly yeah. and kind of, you know, like sort yeah. of probably how they felt when they were a teenager going up yeah. before they were able yeah, to, yeah. to figure out that whole, you know, uh, a way of, of putting on a, a putting, putting, putting airs on or whatever, you know, like everybody does, but it's just, it's interesting. I, I, yeah. I always found that fascinating when you can catch someone when, when they don't know anyone's looking and yeah. it's like, that's how they really feel. Exactly. Yeah. And it makes them less intimidating. Less exactly. Whatever, exactly. You know, like just, they're just a human being just like right. you. So yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. We're all. I wish I'd known this 10 years ago, though. I know. I know. <laughs> so many Same gray here. hairs over nothing. I know. I know. Exactly. <laughs> all that stress. Yeah. So unproductive. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so, well, how do you, so how do you divide your, uh, your, do you have a schedule? Mm-hmm. Do you have like a yeah. strict art schedule, work schedule, or, or, you know, how does that work? So I love this part about my job. I have a schedule, the exact same schedule every week. So I work Tuesday, Friday days, Thursday, Saturday nights, and then I can pick up a fifth shift whenever I want. So oh, I always know what my schedule is going to be. That's great. Um, and if I need time off for conventions or whatever, I can just swap with somebody else or whatever and work the first half of the week they, or whatever. They, do they know you're an artist and have this kind of secondary career and they're super mm-hmm. cool with that? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. that's great. As long as you can get your shifts covered, they don't care if you take – like I took three weeks off for vacation. Um, and there was a girl who traveled, I think, for two months or something because she's a travel agent or something. So as long as you can get your shifts covered and make deals with people and stuff like that, they really don't 
mind, which is awesome. That's great. Um, it's kind of like but the, yeah, like the best. And then there's people always asking if they, I can draw them naked and stuff. Of course, <laughs> my coworkers. <laughs> Not all of them. But yeah, you know, right. Every job I've had someone ask. Oh, usually a guy if I can paint him naked. <laughs> oh my god, really? <laughs> trying to be creepy they're actually trying to be funny because they see my life drawing stuff oh, I and they're see. like right yeah yeah um, i can see how that could have come off really weird but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's always someone who makes a joke about the life drawing which is i find hilarious it's like it's it's not that big a deal but yeah for I some, know. For some I know. reason it freaks lay people out i know yeah um, yeah any kind of nudity freaks people yeah. out really <laughs> But yeah, so usually um, I, I tend to keep my Sundays and Mondays off because that feels like my weekend. So I do most of my art then um, and then basically work around my schedule. So if I work a day, I'll come home and do art at night and vice versa. If I work a night shift, I'll start um, either painting or drawing by day. But yeah, lately I've been mostly writing. I've been trying to get act one of my story finished. Like there's 12 scenes and I just finished the 12th scene last Friday and now I'm going through the process of re like editing that part before I, I hand, hand it off to you. Um, so like beta readers and stuff. Um, mm. So yeah, the writing days, I just literally just sit and write. And anytime I get stuck, I actually go outside. I have a, a balcony area now where I just sit out there and just, I can listen to the birds and see the sky and stuff like that. And just get my mind off of the thing that's stressing me out. Right. Um, when I'm painting, um, like if I have a show and I want to get a painting done, which is going to happen for WonderCon. I have this epic piece in the works with like oh, 15 cool. characters. Wow, amazing. Yeah, I can't wait I, to paint big again and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I do the same thing, but just with, with art. I love to just warm up with sketches in my sketchbook and just do studies and stuff like that. Um, like I'm a drawer first and a painter second. So that's, why you're, always... so, that's why you're so good. I mean, that's oh, really, that's, I mean, that's the foundation of great painting is drawing, I think. Yeah. You know? But I think that like drawing and painting are two different sides of my brain sometimes. Like it's like for me, I, I guess I think more in shape now, the, like the longer right. I've been painting, I realize it is more about shape instead right. of line. And that's helped my drawing too. Mm -hmm. Because I think if you only think in line when you're drawing, it actually won't be as structured and stuff. Um, so yeah, yeah that's definitely. been really fun. Just getting all those things clicking into place recently has been great. Um, but yeah, I just, I set up my, I try to set up my phone onto a tripod to record time-lapse videos while I paint. And I share that with my patrons too. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, I don't have a, like a structure in terms of like long-term. That's something I was going to ask you when you're working on your book. Do you have like deadlines for when certain paintings are going to be done? And, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> like I don't have that in place. Yeah, it's I'm like not, painting I, at a time. I'm not the person to ask about that <laughs> because <laughs> I had, I, you know, that's, that's actually been one of the, the, the problems with getting the book done is because I'm living off my artwork, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how much I'm going to be making from month to month. And every right. time I'd get the ball rolling, this has happened seriously for four years. Every time I, I start working on the book, get the ball rolling, I get in the flow mm -hmm. and, oh shit. I got to pay the bills next week yeah. and I don't have any money. Okay. Yeah. So now I got to just shift gears and start, okay, I'm going to, am I going to release a print? Am I going to do some studies? What mm -hmm. am I going to do here? And it's just been going on like that. So mm -hmm. I've just only been able to work with these little chunks and then getting distracted yeah. every month. It's been that. So, mm -hmm. so I'm not the person <laughs> to ask definitely um, mm -hmm. about that. So I, I'll, you know, hopefully I'll figure that out in the next couple months and be done with this. And then I'll let you know. How... Well, it's tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a bitch, but um, I've I have got... I've had a little bit of uh, like I can kind of relate to that in the sense that sometimes I feel like when when uh, when work is sort of too interspersed, like day on day off, day on day off, um, mm -hmm. I, f I feel that too. It feels kind of like um, I'm working on my stuff, like I and then I have to like jump into work mode. Okay, now I have to go and hustle and make money and stuff, and not think right. about my art, and then I have to get back on somehow. And like turning it on and off sometimes actually is very draining. And then there's and and there's times like last week where I'm just like, you know what, I just need four days in a row mm -hmm. where I can just focus. Right. Um, and that is the dream. I think most of us just wish we could just know we have a financial backing and just do the thing. Yeah. But anytime you have to be thinking. But that's the thing. It's like being a full time artist. You don't just get time to just work. You you're running your own business. You're yeah. paying for the bills. Yeah. And then you have to make sure the art is that you're making is selling and all that stuff. And it's it's like having two jobs anyway. Yeah. I'm a full time artist, and most people don't realize. Yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. And two 
completely different jobs. Like yeah. you can't get any, you know, uh, the business part of, of, uh, having an art business and the art part are so it's about as different as you can get brain, Absolutely. brain function wise. Mm -hmm. So, and then having to switch from that from day to day, or sometimes even like, you know, usually my day is the first part of my day is business stuff. And then the second part is the mm -hmm. art stuff. So it's like, yeah. you, you're, you're switching gears or me every day. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of makes you feel like you're crazy sometimes yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and just getting in the flow, you know, getting in that mindset is, you know, after you're, you're, you know, doing all these, you know, clerical things and, and, and dealing with customer service emails and mm -hmm. technical things about your printer not working and, you know, printing yeah. orders and then switching to go, Oh, I'm going to go relax enough to mm -hmm. make something some a great piece of artwork it's like it yeah. takes it's hard to do it's it's hard to do it's and you a, have to you can't like you're right you can't just toggle between the two it's not like yeah, a switch yeah you exactly need to <laughs> transition over somehow and then it still might not work and right i think there's that expectation too with social media that it's like you have to have the consistently good art you know every day or yeah, at least right. every week or this certain productivity level and it's just Honestly, it's like being self-employed is not all that it's it, like everyone thinks it is in terms of just a bunch of free time. Oh, to yeah. <laughs> I still I, no. I have to say that again because I feel like that's a total myth, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I always I make this analogy of, you know, I thought, let me see, how, how did I how do I say this? When I was when I was in effects, I was thinking that that uh, having my own art business, I would be like, like, this is my effects job happiness i felt like it would be like this much better mm. or you can see like way up there yeah, yeah way up there and <laughs> what it turns out to be it's like about that much better <laughs> you know, it is better yeah it's better than the day job i say you know for for me it's better than working the day job but it's not amazingly better because yeah. you're, you're getting all this other shit that you don't have to deal with mm -hmm. when you just are relying on a day job for money yeah. You know, it's, it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. There's, it's, it's like you get all, you sure you get creative freedom. Um, but you, you also get, you also have to work every single day for mm -hmm. ridiculous hours and you can't take time to be uninspired or, you know, it's like you have mm -hmm. to, you have to turn it on and you have to do it even when you don't feel like it. And if yeah. you're sick, you're screwed and you have to work anyway. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's really crazy. It's, it's it not, is. it's, um, it's not for the faint of heart. That's no, for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> you have to decide if you're willing to do all that yeah, to have no right. health insurance and no paid time off. And <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> I don't right. have any of those things through my job either, but I'm just saying like, it's just, <laughs> Yeah, right. Like it's just like you have to budget for those things, and mm -hmm. that's uh, already hard as an artist living in a in a major city where cost of living is high, and it's yeah. just yeah. But again, those are all choices you make, and it's, yeah, I feel like there, there's there's definitely a school of thought out there of, of people who think like artists who aren't living off their work, it's like it's because they don't want it bad enough or they yeah. don't work hard enough, and I don't think that's it. Some people just aren't cut out to do both of those things, right. and they don't. Maybe they don't want to, to keep up with all that, and that's perfectly fine, too. You're right, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. It's fine. You, it, not, <laughs> it's not for everybody. It's not for yeah. everybody. Um, I remember hearing Jeff Koons. You know that sculptor, Jeff oh, yeah. Koons? I saw mm -hmm. some interview, and he, you know, maybe he was saying this completely. I was never really a fan, actually. I'm not a big fan. But he said this one thing during this interview and ever since then I've kind of hated him. I can't get over it, but, <laughs> but I, I, and, and I think, you know, looking back, maybe he was just trying to be pr provocative, but even being provocative for the sake of being provocative pisses me off. But he said, oh, yeah. he said, I just, I just think that I'm, I'm so successful because I want it more than everybody else. Oh, for and sake. I'm like, fuck you, you Seriously. fucking asshole. That is so wrong. <laughs> That's like the same freaking myth that only hardworking people are rich. It's right. like, that is such bullshit. It's like some of the hardest bullshit. people, hardest working people I know are people who make minimum wage. Absolutely. It's, just like, it's yeah. that is the stupidest idea ever. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's so uh, fuck that guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, you were just lucky that what you want 
wanted to do aligned with, you know, so many different things. Right. Like you... where society is, the country you came from, you know, well, all these different things. Like, that anyway. probably, yeah, probably that plus he knew the right people that could right. get him the right collectors because, you know, and... on that level of the blue chip level, it's all who you know, who, who, who gets anointed as the the golden child that d- mm-hmm. deserves to be collected and a bunch of people laundering their money a bunch of rich people basically you know laundering money oh, it's, it's such a scam it's so it it's really so is. it's so weird that that level of the highest level of art of fine art is is so corrupt because mm-hmm. what art is in at its essence is such like a spiritual magical real spiritual thing and then on the highest level of it it is like the the most materialistic corrupt fake fake bullshit bullshit. (laughs) and the art sucks on top of it it's not like even getting out of it yeah it's not even like the artwork is the best at the top either either it's such a weird oh my god but you know it's just like anything anything great the people on the ground level are, are the are the ones doing the great work you know the people yeah fuck them but it's crazy. I, we were just in, like I said, on vacation. We actually love to go to art museums and stuff like that. And some of my favorite artists, late 1800s, early 1900s, those figurative painters and stuff that mm. painted just incredible yeah. stuff. And those guys, at least at their, you know, their heyday, they were the best paid artists, right? They were the right. ones getting yeah, the big yeah, shows. Right. But the art was actually good. I and know. it's like, <laughs> what, you, you what think, happened? Yeah, you think <laughs> at that level, you'd at least be like, you know what? I, I, you know, I know this is, this whole system's corrupt. I'm getting way more money than I deserve. The least I could do is try and make really incredible, amazing artwork. But it seems yeah. like they, I don't know. That's a whole, it's, it is, it's a whole other debate. It's a whole it's other just... debate. It's a whole other world. <laughs> I don't really know anything about. So maybe I'm missing something, but uh, yeah, that, that, that is kind of something I wanted to ask you about. Did you, did you get like a good art history uh, education in college? Because that's one thing where I, I feel like I really missed out on because I didn't go to college is I, I'm not really uh, uh, up on my art history like I should be. You know, we did have art history classes and stuff, and we even had a history of illustration class that I actually loved because that was like that, would, that sounds great. History like Norman Rockwell, yeah, and I love that JC Leindecker, all those yep. those guys. Um, and I think all the from there, it's like uh, you know, there are certain parts of art history that I didn't respond to, like those the kind of how do you say it, like very like college college type of like you know teaching history it's just very dry and very uh no what do you what do you mean what do you mean i guess it's just like it's not really about it's just about the theory i guess and i I don't want to bag it but i just i guess to me it's like i didn't the the way that i look at art now when i look at stuff that's historical whatever it's just the stuff that speaks to me just the way i look at any other art you know so it didn't really change how you view the artwork not really. Like, I, I guess it explained more to me how political art is mm. or how, you know, this whole game that we're talking about just right now, like it made some of that make sense just in terms of at the time, this is what was, you know, what was thought of. And maybe, yeah, actually, one of the biggest things I learned from art history classes is some paintings that you wonder why the heck that's famous. You know, they right. kind of decoded it for you and say this meant this, you know, all the symbolism behind it, which is definitely interesting. But when I go into a museum, I don't actually love looking at those particular paintings right. even if i understand the significance right, so it's right. just i think there's people who love that side of art history and are intrigued by that and um and i found it interesting but it's still not why i respond to art to me it's like it's it's a painting that was done hundreds of years ago and i could see that you know i'm looking at a painting right now talking about it by john singer Sargent that's on my desk right now uh-huh, yeah. this lady right here i can show you real quick but um oh, i yeah. can see this woman's gaze yeah like, that's she's a, right there yeah it's incredible it's and an amazing one he captured her you know it's like or or just like the storytelling in an image where i can see this scene playing out or whatever it's the same stuff that i look at in art today mm-hmm. and that, and that's the kind of stuff that captivates me or like things like i want to paint like that or i aspire to that or whatever um, but to me, it's like art is about communication. And if I feel something from a painting from someone that did something hundreds, thousands of years ago, that's the stuff I'm going to respond to. Right. Um, and for that, I don't think you necessarily need to be to know about art history. Yeah, it's kind of interesting yeah, to know. Right. Yeah. What was that's going a good on at the point. Time, that's a good you know? point. Yeah. But I, it doesn't take the ad or take any of the enjoyment out of it for me. You know, it's like you like what you like with art. It's yeah. supposed to be subjective. Yeah. Um, some of that stuff is kind of fun to know. But um, same with like when you're watching a period film, if you know certain things about the time, it might make more sense why they're acting in a certain way. 
But if it's a human enough, you know, portrayal or a great story, you'll still enjoy it, even if right, you don't know those right. things. So. No, that's 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 a that's a great point. Um, I I, uh, I I I've never thought about it like that. That's that makes me feel better about being so <laughs> ignorant. <laughs> but but if you think about it, I mean, that's the that's kind of the. Um, <clears throat> I mean, that's the amazing thing about artwork is that it, it, it it's like a secret language kind of that mm-hmm. that people you it it either communicates with people or it doesn't. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. it. You know, your yeah. painting either hits someone or it doesn't. And and that does it. That's beyond um, analysis or mm-hmm. information or technical anything. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. you either like it or you don't. And um that's what I find weird. I hate to bring it back to the, to the blue chip modern art stuff, but that's what I feel like. Uh, I feel kind of like, does anybody go and see the pile of dirty socks in a corner and go, oh my God, it just hit me right here. You know <laughs> what I'm saying? Not a rich person. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do people see, uh, you know, like the big whatever some weird you know yeah, like talk, the balloon like, dog thing or whatever. yeah the conceptual piece do they see that and i just i have a hard time believing that people see that and and, and have that feeling that we have when we see art mm-hmm. it just seems yeah. to me more like it's an intellectual it's all in, intellectual mm-hmm. it's not emotional when when yeah. all the stuff we're going for is about emotion it's yeah. about this deeper thing you know what i'm saying I totally know what you're saying. I feel like there's definitely a divide because there's, I can think of some of my art history or art teachers, I guess mostly art history teachers or the more liberal arts teachers that think more in the conceptual way. Like art isn't supposed to be just emotional and like, like if that's a bad thing, but again, Mm. it's just like, I think that's just their opinion or that's that school of thought. That's what they respond to is the stuff that isn't emotional and that's fine, but that shouldn't, you know, I guess it shouldn't take precedence. It shouldn't take precedence over that. The other, you know, that's the thing that bothers me about the the kind of modern stuff is that, and I've said, you know, people are going to be sick of hearing me say this because I say it all the time on the show, but it's like it gets preferential treatment as if it's the highest art that there is. That's why right. it's up here. And it's like, no, it's no more or less valid than any other style of art exactly. that's going on. So it's not really fair that it's getting held up that way. You know? I totally agree. And the fact that it, to me, it's like, I feel like it's criminal that it's like, there's so many figurative or at least more representational artists that I know today that struggled to get the education they wanted because of that being the type of art that took precedence right. for more than a century. Right, like right. no one was teaching that, you know, it's like it almost it, like the time, uh, the fact that something like that can almost destroy, like not, not destroy, but I guess like prevent artists from, from getting, making the kind of art they want to make. It's right. like, I just feel like, that that is so elitist in my I opinion. know it's terrible it's so it's, it's to me it seems so like anti art it's yeah. like opposite of the whole thing that we're trying to do with with our artwork it's it's I don't know I don't know and in some weird way I can't think of for instance in writing or in in music that ever happening like where you know something like they're trying to make just nonsense like sounds or something into right. music like I, that has never been a thing that yeah took right over the entire yeah yeah it's not and like affected people from taking singing lessons that's or a good, learning that, how to tune a guitar yeah or something. what a great like, what a great point it's not like you know a noise band which you know is a is a thing and there's a, an appreciation sure. for that but it's not like ever all, all that's held up as the highest music and so it gets all the all the uh it gets all the you know, awards and everything. yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's weird it's, <laughs> it's strange the art world's weird it's really it is very weird know, but whatever i don't know i just i just <laughs> that's the one thing that bothers me it's like you know you really you know <laughs> i mean i can i can i can appreciate intellectual ideas you know I, yeah. I i you know i really look up to people that are that are really smart and, and intellectual because I, I don't you know i'm not really very you know educated or that smart so it's like I, I respect people that that know a lot that are educated and um but i just i it just seems like bullshit to me you know uh i but but art being a, like a pure or a mostly intellectual thing just does not seem doesn't feel right to me it just seems yeah funky it doesn't see it just seems it's like all these intellectual elites took art over is what it seems like to yeah. me and it's not it sucks 
Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> I completely agree. I think most people feel that. I think most artists I know think that way too. But, yeah. you know. I think any kind of gatekeeping institution yeah. is just obnoxious to me where it's just like prevents totally. people from pursuing something because of the way things should be. Like they're all just social constructs and they're not, right. you know, they're not necessarily but, true. They're and Yeah. But that's, see, that's the true amazing thing about art is that it does, you know, it 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 hits a person in a, in an emotional way, and communicates with them, regardless of any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. That's why you, that's how you know it's real. Yeah, you exactly. know, that's how you know it's real is when it strikes a chord and it makes you, it, it, or you know, with music or any 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 great art form, if it makes you like cry or makes you just feel, that's the, that's the re, that's the true test. You know, mm-hmm. that can't be faked. Exactly. You know, so yeah. fuck them. <laughs> fuck, <fake shit. laughs> fuck that fake shit in a, in a in a in a in a weird way i kind of wonder though like on some kind of like on a cosmic level i've i always wonder maybe since art reflects the culture art has always kind of been a reflection of the culture mm-hmm. maybe unintentionally because i don't give uh give that that blue chip world that much credibility but maybe unknowingly they are representing how bullshit and fucked up the whole world is because the world is more Mm -hmm. fake than it's ever been yeah more unnatural than it's ever been more full of shit than it's ever been with you know social media reality shows I guess that's the cynical take, though. I feel like <laughs> it is cynical. I definitely, I definitely have a cynical side to me, but I think at the end of the day, I, I keep going because I believe in some semblance of humanity, right? right. Or at least I live for those moments. Yeah, when we for can sure. connect. Yeah, and then, then I guess to me, that's the kind of art I want to make. It's more aspirational, I guess, which I didn't realize. Definitely. I feel like a, my sister or you know some of my friends think I am definitely more of a cynic, but it's, but I guess my choices in my art prove otherwise <laughs> right yeah if you're a real cynic you'd be you'd be taking your Just, dirty socks and throwing them in a corner and, and yeah. charging five hundred thousand dollars for it <laughs> but yeah it's i just it's uh, that's the one thing i go well maybe they are maybe it really is on some weird level maybe it is ref- tr- truly reflecting the culture in a sense in that way yeah I, I think everything comes from something, you know, it's like the reason why that was able to take off is because it made some sense or made some connection. Yeah. But I yeah. just, again, I think back to your point of it being the all encompassing or the only answer, especially in this day and age where it's such a global society and it's not going back. There isn't one way for anything. I think we just need right. to get over that idea. Yeah. 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 If, if, uh, if there's maybe one thing to learn from, from the, the age we're in, it's that it's that. It's yeah. that there is no one way and that everybody's different and that there's all kinds of different ways to get to kind of the same thing, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. The real And that's thing. exciting. That should be exciting. Right. It should be scary. It should be like, I want to see different points of view expressed and different totally. everything um, instead of the status quo or whatever that is. And it's like, I feel like that, that blue chip stuff just feels a bit repetitive at this point. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like if it's just for sensation you know the sort of sensationalism uh, it, it, that gets pretty tired right after a right. while it's got nothing new to add if that's all you're right after a while exactly <laughs> yeah it's like it, it's kind of boring yeah but you know what's the uh it's like that banana thing you remember the mm-hmm. banana everyone was sharing oh, Lord. The, and mm-hmm. it was just like i felt like everybody that was sharing it complaining about it was like playing into the hands exactly of those people <laughs> and that's why they did it Mm-hmm. And it's That's like, exactly what it is. No, no, no. I, I, I wanted to say, ignore it, ignore it. But even then, you're you're playing into it's, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like you can't so, win. I honestly didn't even say a damn thing about it. I was right. like, it doesn't even deserve my waste. You know, my exactly. waste of my breath over that, it. Exactly. That's the, that's the <laughs> proper right. attitude. Those, those people knew exactly what they were doing. They know exactly what our society is right now. And right, and, right. And that's why they did it. And that's smart on their part. But at the same time, it's cyni- just, It is I think it's cynical. cynical. <laughs> it's super cynical. It's um. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 that's what I don't like about it. That's it's the cynicism. Yeah. You know, it's it's very it's like people are stupid and you know, even and I if I make money off of it. Yeah, <laughs> people are stupid and and yeah, and I know how to game the system and it, and yeah, it's cynical. So anyway, okay, no more talk about that. <laughs> but those are, you know, we made some interesting points about it. It, it is something that exists in the world and um, It is. It's just weird yeah. that 
and, you know, we're artists too. So it's like, yeah. that's kind of connected to us in some way, but mm-hmm. I just feel so totally. And I think most artists feel this way, completely alienated from mm-hmm. that scene. Like it's on another yeah. planet and it yeah. has nothing to do with art to me, but mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. I think it's just important to know that it's like, if you don't agree with making that kind of art, just don't. Yeah, you know? exactly. Make, yeah. You make don't... the kind of art that you want to see more of or that you enjoy. Right. And it's like, at the end of the day, like that might be kind of simplistic and that might not be what any critics want to hear, but it's right. like, to me, that's, that's it's what it tr- means to me anyway. I, yeah, I agree. Totally. Um, I, I have to say one final point about, about the, about the blue chip <laughs> stuff is uh, I would like to talk to somebody that, that is one of those people to like kind of pick their brain and, and try and understand where they're coming from. Cause I am interested to, to know how they're thinking about things and maybe it'll make more sense to me. So, but that's all. I, I won't say anything yeah. else. That's you not... heard the call. Go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I can get it. someone on the, on the podcast, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another thing I wanted to ask you is we're getting, we're getting uh kind of close to the end here but uh what what's your setup what's your studio setup like are you um do you have a is it like your house like mine basically mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> where you it's live? our second it's our second bedroom and it's like it used to be my boyfriend's office but he doesn't he used to draw and paint and stuff and now he's a director over at blizzard oh um, really entertainment oh, that's yeah cool. so he directs like short films and stuff for them awesome. uh so he does he actually mostly just uses his computer in here and and his ipad out in the living room so this has become my my cave even though we didn't agree upon that (laughs) i've just sort of taken it over so i just literally have his old desk and a table next to it where i have my palette and all my books and everything everywhere and statues and art it's a complete mess but um but yeah it's in my house okay Um, so are you painting a desk Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of the you're not on, slanted oh, desk. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. You're not on an easel, or I you... used to have an easel. I just, but I don't have room for it here, unfortunately. Uh, right. Uh, but yeah, I, I miss that easel. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing this big painting with the desk, though? Aren't you working on a big painting? Yeah, I mean, I can rotate. I think I can make this thing more vertical because it's at a slant if I want to. But mm. um, it's not ginormous it's gonna be 18 by 24 but yeah i'm gonna to have to keep tilting it up oh, okay think, right so. yeah yeah it's not ideal but it's it's hey, the setup i wh- have <laughs> whatever works whatever yeah. works i yeah. i also you we didn't mention uh, i'll put it in the description too but what's your patreon address too because I, I really want people to go join your patreon do you do you know what it yeah. is off the top of your head it's a uh, back uh, forward slash my name. So it's Mia Araujo and that's spelled M-I-A-A-R-A-U-J-O. So there's a double A in there. Okay. But you can spell it out if that's easier. <laughs> okay, cool. And then we'll put, we'll put a link in, in the description as well. So people can, you know, get all your info yeah. in the description. Awesome. Um, so is, is any other exciting things you, you want to talk about before you go or any other projects or, 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 or you're just working on really getting this book done and, and yeah, working yeah, towards definitely. working towards making art your full time gig at some point, I imagine. I would That's like the dream to. still. Yeah, you can do definitely. it. Definitely. You can do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's not it's it's not a um, it's not impossible is what I'm no. saying. I'm sure I'm sure someday I will work full time again. But I guess I'm not as worried I, as I used to be yeah. about how quickly that happens. It's just. I'm, I did take this year off of conventions just to focus on the book, though, so I can get that done. So I'm, I am really excited about that. I think once I get this first act done um, and get it off to, to readers, I'll continue the next two acts and work on this big painting. And then from there, once I have the whole story pretty much fleshed out, um, I will um, do the whole editing process and then start building out the illustrations. So there's, like I said, about 30 of them. Yeah. In the painting, in the that I've plotted out scene by scene, um, plus a bunch of spot illustrations. So it's just a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much all I'm working on. Yeah. But I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> Are you going to have a big show when once it's released of all the artwork? Because that would yeah. be you do the book release, then you have a show of all the paintings from it. That would be amazing, right? Yeah. If any gallery would be interested in that, for sure, I would. I'd be down. Yeah. You got to do that. You got to just. It's going to be, I, don't, I think it's going to be big for you. I think that book will be big for you. It's such a cool, I mean, so far it looks amazing. It's an amazing idea. Thanks. It's going to be good. It's going to be good for you, I think. Thanks. I just wish there were more hours in the day. I know. <laughs> I know. I do. Every day I, I think that. Like, that I could paint faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you're already working with acrylic, so you've got that going for you. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, at least it dries fast. 
I, that's that's the only fast part about it. I'm a pretty slow painter. But... Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you do studies? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, a lot. Yeah. You do a lot of sketching, I know. Oh, and mm -hmm. yeah, I did see studies on your uh, on your website. I think maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 They, they're very, very um, helpful, I find. Studies are kind of... Um, I, I feel weird if I don't do a study now. Me too, yeah. Like before, That's I never did studies because I was so anxious to paint. Mm -hmm. Once I got in the habit, now it feels like feels uncomfortable if I yeah. don't do a study. Like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. And... Anytime I jump in before finishing studies or figuring finishing figuring things out, I always regret it because I'm always figuring it out as I paint. I know, right? And then it takes you like two or three times longer. Exactly. And then you're <laughs> dealing with mistakes instead of just dealing with the painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I always try and tell people that about studies, you know, younger <laughs> painters and stuff. It's like, do your mm -hmm. studies. I resisted it for years myself, so I understand not wanting to take the time. But the other thing is you sell the studies and then you can make there a little extra money. So it's exactly. totally worth it. Same goes for sketches too, mm -hmm. you know? Definitely. It's like rehearsal, and then the right. painting is the concert or the there performance. There you go. So. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, rehearsal. It's like you're rehearsing for the painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a cool idea. Well, uh, okay, one last thing. What's your, uh, te technically, what's what's your technical process with, with painting? Are you, Do you like uh, an underpainting person and a slowly building things, or do you kind of like, you, you know, because I kind of, I do underpainting. I build it up slowly, kind of, and then I do yeah. a lot of color glazing to get my colors, but how do you do it? I actually don't do it. I mean, I block in sort of local colors instead of doing an underpainting. I do want to try that at some point, just mm. like a like a sepia tone underpainting. Right. I've never actually done that. Mm. Oh, really? Um, wow. Yeah, I just sort of block in the shapes by a local color and then just start as I, I just like start rendering out to, to highlight or to dark and to dark. And it's, but, I, but I tend to have, um, the first pass is like, um, basically local color shapes shape blocking the entire piece so i know it's basically uh it's very hard to explain but it's like it's in color but it's got the values that i'm going to be right. going for in terms of the middle tone if that makes sense right, right right um so the whole general value of the of the piece is there um interesting I, i'll do the dark shapes then after that first so i can get my my darkest dark and then work to light um mm. so yeah probably wow. not yeah, that's just the way I've always painted. But, but yeah, I've thought about the whole underpainting thing. Like that's what most oil painters do, and I I'm very right. curious about doing that. But I actually don't glaze with acrylics. Like right. I just that's, I tend to to dry brush or that's paint the, with thin layers. That that's my my only real complaint about acrylics, other than the drying too fast for me, is the glazing. That's the mm -hmm. one. That's the one area I feel like oils has the edge over acrylics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that you can glaze and it's clear like they have glazing mediums with acrylics but it kind of mm. makes it white they're kind of whitish so, yeah, so when you glaze the color things. on it doesn't mm. look like that color like when you're glazing oils it, you're glazing it and you can see it right there and then it right. just wait for it to dry so that's the only one little mm. one little thing i wish acrylics could somehow figure that one out but um <laughs> but you can glaze oils over acrylics so that's a possibility Hmm. Yeah, that yeah. might be cool to try. Yeah, to but, just do a sepia like underpainting in acrylics and then glaze with with oils. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I only do it because I only do the underpainting because that's how my dad did it, and so mm. I kind of grew up watching him. And um, I got a book when I started painting too, a Boris Vallejo, and he talked mm -hmm. about how he did his paintings. He does the brown underpainting, and I think Rosetta right. maybe. So it's like kind of the the artist that influenced me did it. So I just yeah did it and then i just stuck but you yeah, know that's awesome. I, I see people painting on white they just start you know you see some of these painters they just white canvas they just <laughs> yeah. paint like a finished eye and then they keep make, finishing it yeah. i don't even get that i don't even get that either it's like if, unless you're using the same lighting situation in every piece and you know it by now i'm just like how would you know that that whole <laughs> the whole lighting of the piece is going to work if you just right. have isolated I don't... white i don't get it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it trips me out it definitely is a uh is, is a trip but there's some it's that's what's another cool great amazing thing about painters is that everyone has just like you're saying there's no one way to do something yeah it's fascinating However you arrive at it is honestly yeah. more power to you <laughs> yeah if you enjoyed it if it's if you're happy with the painting then that's that's all that matters you know yeah, yeah so. definitely. well thank you so much for coming on that was a really enjoyable conversation Likewise, um, I, I really like talking to you about it. Yeah, it's super fun. <laughs> People are going to love this um, podcast. And join uh, me as Patreon. You trust me, you'll you'll really like it. It's really good. And we all have to start 
supporting each other's Patreons because this is how we, we make it as artists. You know, if, if you can afford it, we should be supporting each other. So, um, it's, uh, uh, what is it again? Mia, Mia Rajo. It's, mm-hmm. it's, but it's patreon.com forward slash Mia for, Rajo. Mia Rajo. Okay. And then I'll put it in the description and as, as well as your, your, um, social media links and your website and all that business. So, um, all right. Uh, also, people, if you want to join the Dark Art Society Patreon, you can join at patreon.com slash darkartsociety. And then there's my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash chetzar. You can join that. And um, everyone everyone, get on Patreon because it's great. Right? It is great. Isn't it great? It is great. It's, you should <laughs> use the app, too. It's like you can scroll through chronologically and look at amazing art. No I know. ads. I know. I feel like an ad, but it's like that. It's really great. Right? No, no date. No one's mining your data either. They're really good about exactly. that. You know, the, the guy who started it is like very much not into all that stuff. So, and, and it's like still kind of mom and pop style. Mm-hmm. Like the, mm-hmm. the guy who started it is still the guy who owns it. They, they haven't yeah. sold it. And they're like a bunch of young people and they're real idealistic and super cool. Mm-hmm. So anyway. and they're always looking to improve it and yeah. stuff like that. So yeah, it's legit. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for for coming on. Um, don't Thanks hang up again. when I, when I stop the stops because it'll be a weird, awkward thing if you if we just hang up on each other. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, so say goodbye to the audience. Goodbye. Bye. Audience. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Thanks.